Chapter 14 of the Posthumous Essays of John Churton Collins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Posthumous Essays of John Churton Collins. Chapter 14 Browning and Butler. An ingenious divine of the last century is said to have drawn a parallel between George the Second and Enoch. And Fluellen, as we all know, confirmed his comparison of Henry the Fifth and Alexander the Great by pointing triumphantly to the fact that there was a river in Monmouth and a river in Macedon. It may be supposed that, in associating the names of Browning and Butler, I must be aspiring to rival the feet of our George and Enoch friend, and that I propose to amuse my readers with a display of paradoxical ingenuity. But I am not. I detest paradox, and that I am not to be put down as a Fluellen, I may explain that the parallel passages which I shall presently adduce are not designed to imply either that their matter is common only to Butler and Browning, or that Browning borrowed from Butler. I am inclined to think that Browning was a reader, and a careful reader, of Butler, but I am quite prepared to admit that what we find in Browning's works, common and peculiar to Butler, might still have been found in them, had he never read a line of the Analogy and Sermons. Why, then, it may be said, institute any comparison at all? My answer to this will explain the scope and purport of this essay. Browning and Butler seem to me to have so much in common that a comparative view of the points of resemblance between them hardly fail to be at least interesting. Both were men of a very high and a very rare type, of singular purity, simplicity and honesty both were profound and subtle thinkers both consummate logicians both penetrated in an extraordinary degree with the religious sense both brooded painfully and incessantly on the mysteries of life both united to the temper of the ruthless logician and philosophical recluse the intensest sympathy with all that calls for sympathy in man's fortune and constitution. Being both of them, in an eminent degree humane and philanthropic, at once fearless and reverent. Both sought, both yearned, in passion for a solution of life's riddle, for light, for truth, and would not palter, of both could it be said in Tennyson's words, quote, He fought his doubts and gathered strength. He would not make his judgment blind. He faced the specters of the mind and laid them thus. He came at length to find a stronger faith his own. And power was with him in the night which makes the darkness and the light and dwells not in the light alone. This is from In Memoriam, 96. Both discerned in the Christian revelation, at least the nucleus, the essence, of what man needed, needed spiritually, needed morally, in the way of support and in the way of inspiration, and both, therefore, became its apologists and champions. Neither either acknowledged or felt that, in repelling its assailants, he had advanced a step toward establishing the authenticity and truth of the thing itself. And if Butler, in his scrupulous truthfulness and candor, has raised more doubts than he solved, Browning has left it at least open to debate. If men wished to be nice and curious, whether personally he could be regarded as a Christian or not. For these reasons, then, I have associated the names of Bishop Butler and Browning. I have myself got so much pleasure and help, I do not mean in a theological sense, 
but in a general way from Butler's analogy and sermons that I am glad to dwell on their interest as contributions, not to militant theology, but to the humanities, and to show that writings which are popularly associated only with the groans of candidates for ordination have very real and very precious worth in other spheres of study. There is one intelligible and consistent theory accordant with reason and accordant with experience on which the scheme, constitution, use, and meaning of man's life on earth may be explained, and that is that it is designed to try and test him, that it is ordained as a period and process of probation. This idea, I need hardly say, pervades Browning's philosophy of life. It is the kernel of Rabbi Ben Ezra, is involved in the faith of apt vulgar, is the whole burden of Easter day, is the deduction of the elaborate logic of La Saziasas, is a leading article in the creed of the Pope, in the ring and the book, and finds other expression in poems or in passages of poems too numerous to specify. Two memorable chapters in Butler's great work, namely the fourth and the fifth, deal most fully and elaborately with this subject. His thesis is, quote, As the moral government of God, which religion teaches us, implies that we are in a state of trial with regard to a future world, so also his natural government over us implies that we are in a state of trial in the like sense with regard to the present world. End quote. How exactly Browning is on the general question in harmony with Butler will be apparent to anyone who will take the trouble to read these two chapters. Involved in this theory as necessary corollaries are five other leading tenets of Browning's theology, which for the sake of clearness may be arranged under separate heads. A. E that a state of probation, being, as it obviously must be, a means of education and discipline, involves the existence and activity of what tends to perplex, impede, and pain us, namely, uncertainty and doubt, evil in various phases, disappointment, affliction, and suffering. B. That this education and discipline extend continuously and progressively through all the stages of life, deepening, broadening, expanding, always a process, never completed or completing its result, an ungarnered harvest, its effect increasing confidence in the evidence of things unseen. C. That a necessary corollary of this is the existence of a future life, the protraction of individual consciousness after death, that death, while it destroys the body, so far from quenching or suspending the activity of the soul, merely alters the conditions, very much for the better, under which it exercises its activity. D. That as progress is the law of the soul's life here on earth, so by analogy we may presume that it will be its law elsewhere, and that as it passed from point to point, from stage to stage in development under earthly conditions, such also, presumably, will be its career under unearthly. d. That individual man, an infinitesimal point in the boundless immensity of God's wholly incomprehensible and unintelligible scheme, has, however, entrusted to him in the gift of life a responsibility awful beyond expression. For a free agent, what he does or what he fails to do is of concern, not to time only, but to eternity, not to himself alone, but to the scheme of things. He can fulfill or he can counteract, so far as he himself is concerned, the law of the soul's life, progressive development. I proceed to my parallels under the first heading, 
it will be remembered how often browning has pointed out the wisdom of providence with a capital p in ordaining that doubt and uncertainty should continually disturb and harass us in this life that they are not only a part of our probation but they prevent us from stagnating brace nerve and exercise us nay that without doubt faith could not exist blauchram puts this very forcibly in la sias sias browning shows us what would be the result of the substitution of certainty for uncertainty with regard to the question of a future life either the immediate resignation of this life or absolute indifference to it or the paralysis of the will st john says quote, such progress could no more attend his soul for all its struggles after found at first and guesses changed to knowledge absolute then motion weight his body were all else than it the solid earth on every side where now through space he moves from rest to rest that's from death in the desert and in easter day its importance as a factor in probationary discipline is elaborately argued this is one of butler's chief points and he argues it in the sixth chapter of the second part of the analogy Quote, the difficulties in which the evidence of religion is involved which must complain of are no more a just ground of complaint than the external circumstances of temptation which others are placed in or than difficulties in the practice of it after a full conviction of its truth speculative difficulties are in this respect of the very same nature with these external temptations again what constitutes what chiefly and particularly constitutes the probation in all senses of some persons may be the difficulties in which the evidence of religion is involved and their principal and distinguished trial may be how they will behave under and with respect to these difficulties end of quotation but the two chapters should be compared in detail with Browning. But life has severer and more drastic discipline for the probationary soul in the form of conflict with evil, of disappointment, apparent failure, suffering, and pain. Illustrations of Browning's teaching on this point are needless because they pervade his works. The note is struck in Rabbi Ben Ezra. Quote, then welcome each rebuff that turns earthly smoothness rough each sting that bids nor sit nor stand but go be our joys three parts pain strive and hold cheap the strain learn nor account the pain dare never grudge the throw End quote. And in the prayer of him for whom God in a vision had made the world yield all that the world could yield of comfort and happiness, quote, Let that old life seem mine no more, with limitation as before, with darkness, hunger, toil, distress, be all the world a wilderness. Only let me go on, go on, still hoping ever and anon, to reach one eve the better land end quote. and who was content to quote, go through the world try prove reject prefer still struggling to effect my warfare happy that i can be crossed and thwarted as a man end quote. these were from christmas eve and easter day from which flows his oft-repeated paradox that life may be a failure in being a success and a success in being a failure bishop butler does not put it so trenchantly but his views on this point are exactly in harmony with browning's as a place of probation only and as an amply furnished storehouse of the means of probationary discipline not as a place to be comfortable and happy in, 
is this world to be regarded. I will not give parallel passages, but will sum up his heading by placing side by side with Easter Day a passage from Butler. It is from his sermon upon the ignorance of man. The position of Browning's poem is this. Two friends are discussing Christianity. One accepts it through faith and comments on the difficulty of being a Christian in practice. The other cannot accept it through faith and expresses his surprise that anyone who really believed in its promises should find any difficult in its practice. In the dialogue which ensues, it is shown that the teaching and promises of Christianity are not designed, as the skeptic proposed, to add charm to the world and a zest to mortal life, but rather to wean the soul from earth and to teach it to regard mortal life and the world as means of probationary trial. It is this creed which supports the faith of the Pope and gives him the key to the spectacle presented by the world. I can believe this dread machinery of sin and sorrow would confound me else, devised all pain at most expenditure, of pain by who devised pain, to evolve by new machinery in counterpart the moral qualities of man. How else? This is from Ring in the Book, page 10, 1374. Here Butler. Quote, it is surely reasonable, and what might have been expected, that creatures in some stage of their being, suppose in the infancy of it, should be placed in a state of discipline and improvement where their patience and submission is to be tried by afflictions, where temptations are to be resisted, and difficulties gone through in the discharge of their duty. Now if the greatest pleasures and pains of the present life may be overcome and suspended, as they manifestly may be, by hope and fear, and other passions and affections, then the evidence of religion, and the sense of the consequences of virtue and vice, might have been such as entirely in all cases to prevail over these afflictions, difficulties, and temptations, prevail over them so as to render them absolutely none at all. But the very notion itself now mentioned of a state of discipline and improvement necessarily excludes such sensible evidence and convictions of religion and of the consequences of virtue and vice. One condition of this world is a school of exercise for this temper, and our ignorance, the shallowness of our reason, the temptations, difficulties, afflictions which we are to be exposed to, all equally contribute to make it so. The general observation may be carried on, and whoever will attend to the thing will plainly see that the less sensible evidence, with less difficulty in practice, is the same as more sensible evidence, with greater difficulty in practice. Therefore difficulties in speculation as much come into the notion of a state of discipline as difficulties in practice and so the same reason or account is to be given of both. End quote. Let us turn now to the second thesis, that this education and discipline extends, continuous and progressive, through all the stages of life, always a progress, never completed, never completing. This is another cardinal article of Browning's teaching. It is the keystone of the grammarian's funeral, is involved in the vision of apt vulgar, is the foremost fact to the Pope. Quote, Life is probation, and the earth no goal, but starting point of man. End quote. Is the kernel of old pictures at Florence, pervades Paracelsus, perplexes Cleon, who having no assurance or presumption of immortality, is without the key. It was because the rabbi Johannan Hakadosh, forgetting that life's significance lay in its incompleteness, estimated his actions merely in relation to their supposed intrinsic value, not remembering that their object was to keep him working that God might estimate their worth. 
It was thus that he would have died a failure had not childhood given him the true key. We need not multiply illustrations. It is stated most simply and directly in Rabbi Ben Ezra. The education of youth is a prelude to that of manhood, that of manhood to that of old age, old age to that which extends to the moment of death, when earthly life, having completed its task, the perfect cup is in the potter's hand ready for his use. Thus there is no interval. What life in youth is to life in manhood, and life in manhood to that of old age, so that of old age is to the life that shall come after death each life completing the former. This is exactly the theory of Butler. Quote, Our existence is not only successive, as it must be of necessity, but one state of our life and being is appointed by God to be a preparation for another, and that to be the means of attaining to another succeeding one, infancy to childhood, in childhood to youth, youth to mature age. End quote. And thus he concludes the former part of life is to be considered as an important opportunity which nature puts into our hands, and which, when lost, is not to be recovered. And our being placed in a state of discipline throughout this life for another world is a providential disposition of things exactly of the same kind as our being placed in a state of discipline during childhood for mature age. Our condition in both respects, uniform and of a piece, and comprehended under one and the same general law of nature, the capital N. Thus have both Butler and Browning drawn the same conclusion from the same analogy. On the third thesis, or series of these, namely the existence of a future life, the protraction of individual consciousness after death destroys the body, and the entry of the soul after it is freed from the shackles of the body, on a fuller life they are entirely at one. For illustrations from Browning's poem, which would be endless, may be constituted what he wrote to a friend not long before he died. Quote, you know as well as I that death is life, just as our daily, our momentary dying body is none the less alive and ever recruiting new forces of existence. Without death, there could be no prolongation of that which we call life. End quote. And we all know with what a trumpet note he proclaimed this gospel immortally in verse in one of the last poems he wrote. Under this heading I will merely illustrate from Butler, leaving the reader to recall analogies from Browning. Of death. Quote, we cannot argue from the reason of the thing that death is a destruction of living agents, because we know not at all what death is in itself, but only some of its effects, so that there is nothing more certain than that the reason of the thing shows us no connection between death and the destruction of living agents. It destroys the sensible proof which we had before their death of their being possessed of living powers, but does not appear to afford the least reason to believe that they are there, or by that event deprived of them. End quote. Of life after death. Quote, Suspension of reason, memory, and the affections which they excite is no part of the idea of death, nor is implied in our notions of it, so that our posthumous life, whatever there may be in it, additional to our present, yet may not be entirely beginning anew, but going on. Death may, in some sort and in some respects, answer to our birth, which is not a suspension of the faculties which we had before it, or a total change of the state of life in which we existed when in the womb. 
but a continuation of both, with such and such great alterations. Nay, for aught we know of ourselves, of our present life of death, death may immediately, in the natural course of things, put us into a higher and more enlarged state of life, as our birth does, a state in which our capacities and spheres of perception and of action may be much greater than at present. End quote. Again, quote, the constitution of human creatures, and indeed of all creatures, which come under our notice, is such that they are capable of naturally becoming qualified for states of life, for which they were once wholly unqualified. End quote. And so, like Browning, Butler argues the progressive education and capabilities of man. Thus, and this leads us to what was comprised under D, what is now dark to us in the scheme of things may some day, and under other conditions, become clear. In other words, we may see completed what we now see only fragmentarily and in tendency. Butler discerns in the scheme of things a tendency towards a perfect system of moral government and he deduces from this the probability of a completion of that moral government, the existence, in effect, of that of which we here only see the principles and beginning. This is exactly Browning's, quote, On the earth the broken arcs, in the heaven a perfect round, end quote. Again, what is apt vulgar but a splendid presentation in figurative expression of Butler's remarks in chapter 8 on the probable harmony of God's vast and complex scheme of life could we view it not in part but in totality. But nothing links Browning and Butler more closely than their intense consciousness and conviction of the tremendous seriousness of life and the importance of seeking as support some solution of its enigma. It was this which led both of them to realize the momentous importance of the Christian revelation. They both felt, though in different degrees, how much is involved, or may be involved, in its authenticity or spuriousness, in its rejection or acceptance. Each satisfied of its divine origin, became therefore in simple honesty its strenuous apologist. Butler stood forth as its champion against Toland and Collins, Browning against Strauss and Renan. But the power, and I will add the charm of the analogy, lie quite apart from its relation to religious controversy. They lie not in what it achieved, but in what it suggests and reflects. A relic of extinct controversies, with much of it in which is outworn and effete, it is yet pregnant with instructive, fertilizing, inspiring thought, and this constitutes its power. Its charm lies in the fidelity with which it reflects the character of its author, his pathetic earnestness as of one pleading for lives in jeopardy, his scrupulous candor and honesty, his modesty, moderation, and truthfulness, his piety, his philanthropy. As beautiful a soul, as beautiful a character as ever expressed themselves on earth, are mirrored in these writings. Another interesting point of resemblance between Butler and Browning may be found in the distinction which they draw between the sensuous impression of ideas and their subsequent retention and activity independent of bodily organs, and the use to which they have applied this as an argument in posthumous existence. In A Death in the Desert, Browning describes three souls, the soul that acts, the soul that knows, and the soul that is. The first two are linked with the body, wax, wane, and perish with it. Their use was the use of earth to gather all that can be gathered by sensuous experience in a sensuous sphere. 
all this passing into existence molds and makes the man's self in quotations the soul that is with a capital i in this soul wholly independent of what death can destroy of what is corporeal is immortal let us turn to the analogy chapter one Quote, it is by no means certain that anything which is dissolved by death is in any way necessary to the living beings in its state of reflection after ideas are gained for though from our present constitution and condition of being our external organs of sense are necessary for conveying in ideas to our reflecting powers yet when these ideas are brought in we are capable of reflecting in the most intense degree and of enjoying the greatest pleasure and feeling the greatest pain by means of that reflection without any assistance from our senses and without any at all that we know of from that body which will be dissolved by death it does not appear then that the relation of this gross body to the reflecting being is in any degree necessary to thinking to our intellectual enjoyments or sufferings nor consequently that the dissolution or alienation of the former by death will be the destruction of these present powers which render us capable of this state of reflecting End quote i fear our scientific friends will not think this very satisfactory but with that i am not concerned nor does it seem to have troubled browning very much again both butler and browning have as was very natural in men who were so sincerely anxious to get at truth commented on the inadequacy of the only medium man has for communicating his thoughts to others language Quote, the imperfections, writes Butler, attending the only method by which nature enables and directs us to communicate our thoughts to each other, are innumerable. Language is, in its very nature, inadequate, ambiguous, liable to infinite abuse, even from negligence, and so liable to it from design that every man can deceive and betray by it. End quote says prince hohenstiel quote, do your best words have to come and somehow words deflect as the best cannon ever rifled will End quote. and we all know how voluminous a commentary on the remark is supplied us by the ring and the book it has been said often that butler is a pessimist and if that were so he would of course stand in absolute contrast to browning but butler was no pessimist he has it is true an air of constraint and gloom he has nothing of the buoyant confidence of the enthusiast he seems himself to feel no satisfaction even when his arguments are most convincing and his refutation of air most complete he seems to have the embarrassed air of a man delivering a message without credentials of the utter inadequacy of such means as he had at his command to prove to others the truth of what he was himself morally perhaps certain of the truth of christianity no man was more aware than he his position was indeed similar to browning's speaker in fears and scruples Quote, i can simply wish i might refute you wish my friend would by a word a wink bid me stop that foolish mouth you brute you he keeps absent why i cannot think End quote. of all mysteries this seems to me to be the most perplexing that issue so momentous should if the appeal be made to reason rest on evidence so slight that it just and only just turns the scale in favor of the possibility of christianity being true and yet butler and browning contend that man has light enough given to him to light his path if he will only use it this is beautifully put by butler quote, 
the constitution of the world and god's natural government over it are all mystery as much as the christian dispensation yet under the first he with a capital h has given men all things pertaining to life and under the second all things pertaining to godliness quote. and this is exactly the position of the pope in the ring and the book it is true also that butler has painted and a few men in darker and more tragic colors the anarchy and chaos which seem to deform the realm of an omnipotent moral governor. But he was no pessimist. He drew exactly the same conclusion as Browning. He never doubted clouds would break, never dreamed, though right were worsted, wrong would triumph. Quote, the moral government of God is exercised by gradually conducting things, so in the course of his providence, capital H, that every one at length and upon the whole shall receive according to his deserts, and neither fraud nor violence, but truth and right, shall finally prevail. Part 2, Chapter 4 If this is not optimism, what is? End of Chapter 14